This is our week two uh, weekend update video. This is Professor Hasse, and we're the case number one is now posted to Blackboard. I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, first, let's just uh, review some of the key points of these first two weeks of our class. These first couple of weeks of our corporate finance class, this fall two session is to get you back up to speed on the definition of finance and the reason why we study finance. And one of the reasons why I gave you this article is, is, is to talk a little bit about the details or the micros of finance, the capital asset pricing model, the efficient market hypothesis, all that sort of thing that drives investors, that drives companies to make investors happy to provide them with a return on their investment because corporations need capital, all right? Because with that capital, you produce and purchase assets. Assets produce revenue and expenses, which provide profit and cash flow. It's from that cash flow that you pay off the investors. All right. And capital or financial management is a balance of short term and long term capital. We need capital for day to day expenses, accounts payable, payroll. Some of that is supplied by our cash flow of our, of our operations. Other, other sources of capital for short-term capital is lines of credits at banks, that sort of thing. Then we need long-term capital, which is long-term investment in assets that produce returns over many years, major capital projects, which we're gonna spend a lot of time in a couple of weeks on in this class. The financial statements tell us, tell the investors, tell the market how we're doing. Are we making substantial profits? Are we producing adequate cash flow? What's the debt position or leverage of the company? All this equates to what the article was talking about is how finance is changing, how the public or the markets perceive business different now with the globalization of the economies, with different ways of acquiring capital, with different needs and, and ex ex expectations of investors and how that's beginning to change and how we as financial managers have to understand that change and risk in the market. One of the big investment vehicles for individuals over the last couple of years has been indexing or ETFs where you invest in the market. Where I don't trust my judgment to pick Apple computer, I will go with whatever the market says is doing well and that's why you buy an index. It, it equates exactly what the market is. The index, usually that means it has a risk of a beta of one, average risk, but it gives you the conservative investment where you don't really have to worry about losing too much money. You might still lose money, but you'll lose money if everybody else loses money. You'll make money if everybody else makes money. That's safe for a lot of investors. A lot of 401ks, a lot of IRAs are index investing because it's safe. Well, what about investing in individual companies like Apple? What are their profits going to be? What about, what about the, the relationship of your investments of debt and equity? Should you own bonds? Should you own stocks? All of this is, is going to be part of our discussion in case number one, is how do we measure and how do we understand that? Well, one of the key tools of doing this is the value of money, understanding present value and future value. And we talked a little bit about that in our Monday video of this week. And it's the present value or the value of money or the value of capital is determined by three things. The dollar amount that you're managing or what you're trying to find out, the interest rate of either the cost of the money or what the investors expect to make as a return, and the length of time it involves. Naturally, the longer an investment is out there or an asset is out there, the interest rate is going to be different than a more shorter term investment where the rates are a little bit different. And it's a constant struggle in financial management is to understand which rates are most attractive, short term or long term. And that's when we go back to the article that we were just talking about. One of the interesting, interesting things about finance, like everything else these days in November of 2021, we, everything is changing. The pandemic changed a lot of how, how we perceive ourselves as workers and employees and managers. The state of the globalization of the economy has changed how we accept risk in the market and how money is transferred amongst all different countries. 
the state of social issues, political issues, nationalism, racism, diversity, all has changed our concepts dramatically over the last few years. Every election is a crapshoot of who's going to win, who's going to lose, what does that mean? It's creating a lot of uncertainty in, in our investment lives, in our management lives, and in our relationship lives, our lives with the people who, who we, we work with. Everything is changing. And the same goes through in finance. You know, we've developed these theories after World War II, the capital asset pricing model, that everything is based on market risk. You have a risk of the market, the risk of the risk-free market. You have the risk of the individual company, and you measure that risk accordingly by the risk of the company, basically known as beta. We'll talk a little bit more about this next week. But that has changed over time but the changing values, the changing interpretations of, of investors and company, the increased technology. You can get up every morning and put on your cell phone or turn on the internet or turn on your cable television or turn on your satellite and get the latest up to date of everything. Sports, finance, banking, relationships, good God. It's all there for you through Instagram, through social media, through all the cable outlet, outlet, outlets, everything. You have a vast amount of information. That technology has changed us. It's made us paranoid <laughs> in some respects, but also has it increased our awareness of what's going on around us. And that makes us a little bit more sensitive to all this information and how it affects our investments and capital management in companies. This is changing dramatically year in and year out these days. And how this has changed finance, I want to show you a little video about this now. spent five years dwelling on the old financial system and trying to fix it. But this week here in Oxford, I've been at a conference at the Said Business School which is looking at the future of finance. It's fascinating. There's a whole new economics growing based on how people actually interact with each other rather than on maths and equations, and it implies a whole new financial system. Basic principles are starting to come out of the work, uh, including a need uh, for designing robustness uh, into the system. We can't prevent future crises entirely, but we probably can make the system more robust the way engineers make you know, bridges and buildings more robust in the face of shocks. Second, to make them more uh, adaptable uh, in the face of change. We saw with tremendous innovation in the financial system that the regulatory framework was not able to uh, uh, adapt uh, and uh, uh, keep up. And then third and finally is a, a, a financial system built taking into account the real behavior of, of real uh, uh, people. So understanding how consumers and, uh, and banks actually behave and uh, constructing a system built for that rather than uh, some idealized world. Technology and disintermediation have allowed all kinds of new forms of finance. Think of standalone payment systems on your phone or of crowdsourcing for loans. But can we really leave all of this to the market? Shouldn't government be giving this a nudge? Emma Vartolome has produced her own map of the new finance. The market is creating a solution and the market is creating an alternative financial system and the people are working out there in order to come up with new forms of finance. You can call them financial innovation, but I know that, that this is not such a nice concept currently in the way people are perceiving things, but it is innovation in financial services. And I believe that Invisible Hand is already there and is already creating a different uh, system which intrinsically it's more stable than the centralized one because it's an ecosystem like. But there are still a lot of problems. Big banks are well entrenched and oddly they are even more entrenched now than they were before the crisis. I think that the very large banks that we have today um, are, are no longer adapted ideally to providing the services that they provide in a risk-adjusted, cost-effective way. But the reason that they exist is 
through a series of probably unintended consequences, they profit from an enormous subsidy in terms of the cost of the credit and capital um, that overwhelms uh, the disadvantages of the complexity and the additional risks of the complexity um, that, that these large institutions incur. If you take away that, that, that massive incentive to be large, maybe mitigate against it if you can't, if you can't remove it. And I would say I would definitely agree and, and highly endorse um, a, a, a vast liberalization of the ability to create new banks. I'm not saying and, and by the way, I don't think anyone could set up a new bank and tomorrow have a $10 trillion balance sheet. Um, but you can set limitations both in terms of size of balance sheet, complexity of offering um, that are scaled, that allow for a lot of innovation. This is all very exciting, but will a new atomized financial world really work? Don't we need to talk to each other? After all, even JP Morgan himself said that trust was more important to him than all the bonds in Christendom. We have introduced a, a code of ethics. It does include the equivalent of a Hippocratic Oath. Uh, the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment in this country have actually ex introduced a, an examination, a compulsory examination, by the way, in ethics and ethical standards. And among other things, it includes penalties and exclusions for those who breach this. Something is happening, and the old model, which doesn't work, needs to change. That means that we need to start experimenting with new models now, and that, of course, entails the risk that things will go wrong. But the way to proceed is to start building now and to correct mistakes as they arise, not let the new institutions get too big to fail, just like the old ones were in 2008. This is John Authors for the Financial Times in Oxford. And one of the reasons why you're attending MBA school is so you can be prepared to handle this changing world as a manager, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, as an employee. And for you to be able to think and understand the world around you and prepare strategies and reactions and, and changes to your philosophies of running your particular business or your career. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about this with this article, with this video, as I how I want you to think in this class this session. Think as managers, think as investors, think about the world around you, how everything is constantly changing, especially in 2021 and going forward. That our health, our social issues, our political issues, our investor issues, our management issues, our supply chain issues, everything has directly affected how we manage capital and how we try to provide an adequate return in the risk environments of the world around us. One of the advantages of investing in bonds is because you get as an investor guaranteed payments. You know exactly when you're gonna get paid your interest. You know exactly when you're gonna get paid off at maturity. That's what makes bonds so attractive. It's conservative. It's you understand when, when you're getting paid. And that's why it's an attractive thing for management, for financial management. You can set your cash flow requirements knowing when you have to make the obligations of that liability. That makes it very attractive. And if you have to, if you have a poor credit rating or have to interest, uh, in, have to invest or invest in junk bonds with higher interest, you still know when your payment schedule is going to be made. That's the advantage of it. Also, you get a tax break. Interest rates paid on bonds is tax deductible. Whereas stocks, our topic for next week, chapter seven, is I call it in some respects, the Darth Vader of investments. You have no idea when you're going to get paid. Yes, you have a historical track record of dividends or return on investment in the market, which is given to you by the beta calculation, which is given to you by return on investment but it does not guarantee the future. With bonds and debt financing, you know the future. With stocks, it's an unknown, but that's why the returns are usually greater with stocks. And as we know, stock market has been up this year, 2021, heading into the final two months of about 21, 22% this year. Bitcoins are up 112% 
cryptocurrencies, whereas bonds are only up about two or three, four percent. Why? People are still taking advantage of the risk in the market and investing in equities and other types of investments. Well, how does that mean for if I'm a financial manager or a manager of a business or seeking capital? The market is for sexy investments, IPOs, new issues, new risks. But how does that par parlay into the long-term side effects of your company? You need to make sure you can guarantee capital return to your investors and provide assets that guarantee growth for your business. That mix of that relationship is very important. And this sets the tone for our corporate finance class in, in, our, in November of 2021 as how we as students of finance, as students of business management, how can we take all these technology, technology, social media, all this data and apply a more human function to understand what we need to do? As the gentleman just said in the video we just saw, ethics is very important these days. We hear about it every day with diversity, sexual harassment, equal pay in the workplace. That also plays a large part in capital management. So as we move forward into our first case this weekend, I want you to think about how you gauge the world around you personally. What's your career going through these days? Is there upheaval in the company you work for? Are you still not satisfied with your career? And how does it relate to you as an investor in the market? Or if you were running a business today, how would that influence your, your role as a manager? There's a lot of discussion in finance and financial management these days about coming out of the pandemic and getting back into the trenches and really getting to know and being reactive to your employees. Not just being a manager on a Zoom conference call, but really getting involved with the employees to get them feel comfortable to come back to work and work in, your, in this new environment of the post-pandemic world. So as we move into week number three and start talking about equities, and do our first case assessment, case number one, I want you to think about all these thoughts of where we stand today in our financial management world. That's what that article was about. That's what this video is about. And that's what I want you to start thinking about as a way of interpreting the topics that we discuss in our cases. So as we take a look at case number one, and uh, one first, first thing to note, notice how my attire has changed. Uh, that first part of this week's weekend's video was taken from my, my fall 630 class last fall 2021. The only thing that has really changed is our economic conditions now. Uh, now the markets are down 20%. Now people are looking at long-term bonds as investments instead of stocks. Inflation rates are changing. And this has dramatically changed the outlook of financial management. But still the key thing is to understanding the risk and interpret that risk in the current markets, no matter what the economic conditions exist. And that's what we had into case number one this week. If you go now to your, uh, uh, Zoom cases or your Blackboard. And let me just bring that up here. One moment, please. You now see in the left-hand side of your file folders, a uh, case study file folder. If you opened up that case study file fo folder this Sunday, June 19th, you will see our first case study for our class. Now remember, case studies are exactly what they are. They're interpretation of certain circumstances involving your interpretation of, of a variety of things. In this first case, it's your interpretation of the risk and credit of the company that you selected in the week number one discussion post. You are to take that company and do a risk analysis and interpretation in APA paper format. What is APA format? If any of you need a refresher course, an APA format is a paper with a title page, with an abstract or an introduction section, where you state the hypothesis or the conclusion of your case study, then the details of your explanation, and then uh, any uh, references or sites that you need to make. 
The APA format is double spaced. And in the context of this, of this class, uh, it's uh, using uh, the font that's given to you in the description of the specific case. In this class, some ca our case studies will be in this format. In the other cases, it will be in spreadsheet formats, PowerPoint formats. But for this one, we're using the APA format for our work. If you have any questions or that or concerns, just let me know. Again, I've given you two files, a PDF version and a doc version of the same case, and you are to download those files and begin your work. Here's what those files, the file looks like. You have one week to do this work. It's due on Sunday at midnight, June 26. But again, as I've stated before in this class, if you need extra time, just let me know. If you would like an extension of your work to turn it in on the Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday of the following week, week, that is no problem. All you need to do is just let me know via email that you like an extension so I can turn off the dude the due time function in Blackboard because the Blackboard is set for all work to be posted midnight, June 26. If you do not post by then, it locks you out of posting. So that's why you need to let me know you need an extension. I will unlock that and you have some extra time. So that is not a problem. It does not influence your grade whatsoever. So you pick the company that you selected in week number one, and the first part of the case is to do a risk evaluation. What is that company's credit rating? What is their beta? What is their capital asset pricing model required return on equity investment? Use the formula of capital asset pricing model to determine that with these variables, the variable of the beta of your company, the variable of the current risk-free rate as being 3.24%, and the variable of the market rate of return, risk return rate of the market now, 9.75%. Use those parameters and determine based on the beta and the risk of your company, what is the current required return on equity investment. Also, what is the company's current capital structure? As of their most latest financials, you do not have to show me the financials, just tell me what is the percent of assets funded by debt and what percent of assets are funded by equity. In other words, the balance sheet of the most recent financial quarter of your company. Tell me the current capital structure of your company. Then using this information, determine a risk prospectus. In other words, what is the current organizational health as far as the sustainability of future viability of your company. Is it in good shape? Do they have a lot of risk? Do they have environmental risk, social risk, industry risk, market risk, political risk? Give me your interpretation of the future of your company based on what you interpret as their risk today, not only financially, their credit rating, their required return on equity investment, but also other factors that could involve. There are some key takeaways for you to use and ways of explaining your work. Again, this is an APA format. The maximum amount is 10 pages. Minimum is five. Double spaced times New Roman 12 point font. Can't be any more specific than that. If any of you need any help with APA format, here's a little link that explains it a little bit more. But it's pretty straightforward. Title page, abstract page, content page, pages, references. Again, if you need any help, let me know. But at this level of study, you're probably pretty familiar with the APA format. So this work is due a week from today, June 26. Tomorrow, Monday, June 27th, I will have our introduction to our week three video. And also, any, also if you have any uh, interpretations of the coming work, works week with stocks, you might even interpret that a little bit into your case study number one, but just go by what, uh, what is asked for here and, and interpret it that way. Well, thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Good luck with case number one. I'll be around if you need help. Until later, this is Professor Hassey. Have a good day.